Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center and Catholic Studies here at the university. And on behalf of our Hank Center staff, Gabby, Megan, Amy, Emily, Kate, and Joe, and on behalf of Father Jim Prane and the Jesuit community, who are co-sponsors of this event, I am delighted uh, you have joined us for our second annual Cardinal Bernadine Common Cause Lecture, Forming a Catholic Political Imagination in a Time of Cultural Crisis. I'm so pleased to see such a, a broad turnout today. I see students, uh, I see scholastics, I see seminarians, um, I see staff and faculty, I see honored guests, and we're pleased you're here. So pleased, uh, I was gonna say, so pleased that Cardinal Blaise Supich is among us, that the Cardinal had to cancel just last minute, so we, we miss his presence. He is here in, in spirit. He gave the inaugural lecture last year a, a trenchant and life-giving piece called Science of the Times, Witnessing to a Consistent Ethic of Solidarity. Cardinal Supich, uh, Supich's lecture was published by Commonweal Magazine and remains available online. Um, please report that Bishop McElroy's talk today will also be uh, are published by Commonweal Magazine in very short order. So that's a great trend for the series to be sure. You know, it was just over 35 years ago at Fordham University when Joseph Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago delivered the lecture that inspires the series, a lecture that calls us to serious engagement with the Catholic intellectual tradition, the Catholic social justice tradition, a lecture that calls us to account for the whole, a lecture that calls us today with the re renewed and dramatic vigor. Cardinal Bernadine entitled his 1983 talk, A Consistent Ethic of Life in American Catholic Dialogue. And it was bold. We are pleased that you are here to continue this dialogue and to see again how the call to dialogue is also a call to be bold. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our university president, Dr. Joanne Rooney, who will reflect a bit further on these matters and then formally introduce our guest of honor, Bishop McElroy. Dr. Rooney. Good, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Murphy, for your introduction. And welcome to you, Bishop McElroy, of warm, sunny, San Diego. We think of that here today, but we welcome you, despite the weather, uh, to Loyola University Chicago. Bishop, we are so pleased to have you here with us. Your writings about social justice in the public sphere today are recognized for their importance universally. And thank you for stimulating those conversations. A little bit about the Hank Center, of course, which serves an indispensable role here as custodian of our Catholic intellectual heritage. We know that universities grew from the heart of the church and in turn presents truths in a logical, coherent framework. Cardinal Bernadine, for whom this annual lecture is named, was known for his embrace of what we might call a theology of an inclusive both and, instead of the alternative and divisive either or. And that serves at the root of our goal. A little bit about Bishop McElroy, who earned a bachelor's degree in history from Harvard in 1975 and a master's degree in American history the following year from Stanford University, where he also received a doctorate in political science. In 1987, he earned a doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University which resulted in a dissertation, a highly readable study of American Jesuit theologian, Father John Courtney Murray. So without further ado, Bishop, we look forward to hearing your words today and the challenges that I'm certain you will lay down for all of us, even as we are especially grateful for the legacy of Cardinal Bernadine. Bishop. <laughs> Thank you so much for that warm introduction, and it's a delight to be here. It's a delight to be here for several reasons. Uh, one is to see, once again, the beauty of this university and the vibrancy as I walk around, uh, but also to be here because uh, I remember as a young priest, Cardinal Bernadine's 
lecture being given. And it was a very important watershed for the Church of the United States at that time. Uh, it was a new way of looking at the issues which had become somewhat divisive, the life issues and the dignity issues. And through the theme of a consistent ethic of life, which flows profoundly from the Catholic theological framework and foundation, he bid the church in the United States and society as a whole to look anew at the questions of nuclear war, which at that time were so overweening, and abortion, and all the threats to human life that existed at that time, the poverty, nutrition, uh, hydration in the poorest countries of the world, and to see them all as a common challenge to our response as human beings, as disciples of Christ, to reach out and to address the most compelling needs that lie all around us. And uh, finally, I'm glad to be here because it is a sign once again, I'm glad that this uh, uh, Common Ground initiative has been resuscitated again, it's a great thing because it, it, it really goes to a role that the church in Chicago has played for so much of the history of the United States, particularly in the area of social teaching, but much beyond that, of being a real source of leadership and new ideas, new way of looking at things from the heartland of the country that have really set the pace in so many ways. So I'm glad and delighted that you have brought this uh, tradition of the lecture back into being. <clears throat> The contrast between the beautiful vision of politics that Pope Francis presented while speaking to a joint session of Congress in 2015 and the political state of our nation today is heartbreaking. In his address to Congress, Pope Francis began by comparing the fundamental responsibilities of America's political leaders to the role of Moses, emphasizing that the first call of public service is, quote, to protect by means of the law the image and likeness fashioned by God on every human face." Unquote. <clears throat> Recalling the martyrdom of Abraham Lincoln, Francis pointed to the foundational role that freedom plays in American society and politics, and noted that building a future of freedom requires love of the common good and cooperation in the spirit of subsidiarity and solidarity. Citing the figure of Dorothy Day and her thirst for justice in the world, the Pope emphatically demanded that the economic genius of the American nation must be complemented by an enduring recognition that all economies must serve justice comprehensively with special care for the poor. Invoking the legacy of Martin Luther King, Pope Francis urged the nation's political leaders to deepen America's heritage as a land of dreams, quote, dreams which lead to action, to participation, to commitment, dreams which awaken what is deepest and truest in the life of a people, unquote. Finally, Pope Francis cited the life of Thomas Merton and Merton's conviction that only in genuine dialogue and encounter can a world conform to the gospel be pursued on this earth. In Francis' message, the core vocation of public service and of all politics is to promote the integral development of every human person and of society as a whole. It is a vocation which requires special and self-sacrificial concern for the poor, the unborn, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. It is a commitment to pursue the common good over that of interest groups or parties or self-aggrandizement. It is profoundly a spiritual and moral undertaking. As we stand here this evening, it is very clear that there is a profound sickness of the soul in American public life. This sickness tears at the fabric of our nation's unity, undermining the core democratic consensus that is the foundation for our identity as Americans. For us to confront and eradicate this sickness of the soul, it is necessary that there be a series of substantial conversions within our political life, which cannot be merely the work of elites, but must be an undertaking of the whole citizenry. 
The central element of our national sickness lies in the politi bitter political divide which has characterized our political life for the past two decades. The disintegration of partisan relationships in our political leadership. The creation of a culture where political campaigning never ends and thus authentic governance never begins. The transformation of our news and information landscape from a broad perspective which supported consensus to a culture of politically determined and determining media silos that have their own alternative facts. These are the changes which have bred a culture that is bitter and increasingly divided. An article from The Atlantic entitled, Really Would You Let Your Daughter Marry a Democrat, makes this point with analytical depth. In a survey in 1960, Americans were asked this question. Would you be upset if your child married someone from the other political party? 5% said yes. In 2010, Americans were asked the identical question, and 40% responded in the affirmative. It's hard to think of starker evidence in the growing cleft within our society along partisan lines. The reality is the party has become, for Americans, in many ways a shorthand for world view. Once party identity is interpreted as a revelation of a wide constellation of attitudes about culture, religion, class, work, patriotism, compassion, and sacrifice. Moreover, we use this shorthand to discern whom we should converse with in depth about important and sensitive topics, whom we will be more comfortable socializing with, and with whom we are more likely to share common goals. Most distressingly, this partisan cleft distorts our own conception of our obligations as Americans to reach out in need and fragments that sense of obligation. Such an environment creates enormous obstacles to the mission of the church in fostering a political culture that seeks and sustains the common good. As a result, the church in the United States must fundamentally reassess the way in which we as Catholics, and especially those of us who are leaders in the church, carry out the mission of evangelizing the political culture of our country. Catholic teaching has been hijacked by those who break down the breadth of our social doctrine by reducing it to the warped partisan categories of our age, and then selecting those teachings for acceptance which promote their partisan view. Nowhere is cafeteria Catholicism more in evidence than in the facility with which many Catholics speak about church teaching and what it demands in our political life. Current discussions of the concept of the seamless garment of life introduced into American discourse by Cardinal Bernadine are a prime example of this assault on Catholic social doctrine. In his new apostolic exhortation on holiness, Gaudete in Exultate, Pope Francis has made clear the dual and inseparable demands of Catholic faith in the public order. Quote, our defense of the unborn, for example, needs to be clear, permanent, and passionate for at stake is the dignity of a human life, which is always sacred and demands love for each person, regardless of his or her stage of development. Equally sacred, however, are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned and the underprivileged, <clears throat> the vulnerable infirm, and the elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery, and every form of rejection." In the partisan reality of this day, these two complementary claims of the gospel, which Pope Francis emphasizes as unified, are placed in political opposition in our country's framework. Even worse, skilled, skewed distillations of Catholic moral teaching are deployed by both sides to explain why one set of these issues automatically enjoys a higher claim upon the consciences of believers. How can the church effectively evangelize in such a politicized culture? 
not, I fear, by continuing on its present pathway. In 2015, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops issued a new edition of Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. That's a statement that the Bishops Conference puts out every four years, a year before the election to help guide voters and citizens. It was meant to be a source of guidance for Catholic women and men in helping them to prepare for the election of 2016. I myself wrote a pastoral letter with the same purpose, giving less emphasis to the element of intrinsic evil and more emphasis to the notion of the seamless garment than the Bishops' Conference did. In retrospect, I believe that both the conference document and my own pastoral letter suffer from the same defect. As bishops, we tend to teach from principles and moral norms. Our approach is cognitive and exhortational not affective and inspiring. There are, of course, moments and purposes for which cognitive and exhortational treatments are essential in expressing the church's legacy of teaching that springs from revelation and the tradition of reason. But breaking through the hyperpartisan divide of American political culture at the present day is not such a purpose. For this very reason, I think it is worthwhile to turn once again to the opening words of Pope Francis' talk to Congress. He was faced with a bitterly divided legislative body and was expected to speak substantively about the Catholic vision of the common good. I have to say on this, uh, there was a lot of preparation that the Pope did uh, before this uh, talk was put together, and a number of people were queried, what should the Pope say? And I, I did get a call and gave what I thought was a good uh, set of I inputs. And then, then when I heard what he'd done, I realized everything I said was the wrong direction and that he had the right, uh, that he had taken the right choice for it. But he's how he's changed. Here, here's what he had done, I think. He did not frame his address as a cognitive construct. He framed it in an affective and aspirational tone. He spoke of the figure of Moses emblazoned in the chamber of the house on the wall and summoned up the image of God who is emblazoned on every human heart and soul. He spoke of the martyrdom of Lincoln and the cause of freedom and the powerful allure that freedom has for all people. He spoke of the justice that raged in the heart of Dorothy Day and the spiritual depth that Merton could convey across barriers of religion and class. He called us to be dreamers as King dreamed with power and depth and conviction. What Pope Francis was engaging in during his address to Congress was deep level conscience formation. He was proposing that the common good is best served when leaders and citizens operate from a political virtue ethic that is prior and more fundamental to individual public policy issues. Pope Francis in his speech to Congress was suggesting that the core part of conscience formation for faithful citizenship lies not in the moral casuistry of political choice or public policy analysis, but in the evangelization of the heart and soul and spirit of Americans to help them grow in the fundamental virtues which can orient their choices toward the common good. It is the development of these virtues that must constitute the major outreach of the church in our desperately divided culture. We must seek to form within our faith community a Catholic political imagination rooted in the virtues of the gospel so that the disciples of the Lord naturally gravitate toward bringing the gospel message in its fullness to their lives as citizens of our nation. What are some of the political virtues that can bridge the current toxic political division of the United States? Cardinal Ksupich spoke of them once, one of them last year in his Bernadine address. The orientation of the soul which flows from the solidarity that St. John Paul powerfully outlined as a fundamental anchor of Catholic political life. This orientation of the soul reminds us that in society we must always understand ourselves to be bound together in God's grace and committed in the words of his encyclical Solicitudo Re Socialis, quote, to the good of one's neighbor 
with the readiness in the gospel sense to lose oneself for the sake of the other rather than exploiting him, unquote. The virtue of solidarity in Catholic social teaching requires that the men and women of our day cultivate a greater awareness that they are debtors of the society of which they have become a part. They are debtors because of the conditions which make human existence livable, livable <clears throat> because of the indivisible and indispensable legacy constituted by culture, science, and technical knowledge, material and immaterial goods, and by all human condition that culture has produced. It is in this fundamental recognition of profound indebtedness to society that the most central bonds of cultural and societal union can be born. Such a spiritual conversion to solidarity is not alien to the American political tradition. The founders of the country called it civic virtue, and they believed that it was absolutely essential for the success of the new experiment in democracy which they were launching. The founders generally believed the religious belief was one of the few foundations in the hearts of men and women that could produce enduring civic virtue and self-sacrifice, which at times civic virtue demands. It was their hope that a culture of civic virtue would lead to a politics of the common good. A second and equally important virtue of a Catholic political imagination lies in heartfelt compassion for all those who are suffering in society. The hardness of heart that Jesus speaks of so often in the gospel has seized hold of so much of our political life. Distorting compassion into a compartmentalized virtue, which is reserved for those who live within our region, our class, our race, our faith. A truly Catholic political imagination would break through these barriers in the clear conviction that the compassion of a disciple of Jesus Christ cannot be compartmentalized. It finds expression in the face of every form of human suffering. The reality that black men fear for their security when facing law enforcement. The sense of dispossession felt by young white men without a college education. The specter of deportation for mothers and fathers and children in the millions. The utter desolation of parents who have lost their children to gun violence. Rampant patterns of sexual harassment and assault directed against women. The fear the police face every day trying to protect society. These are wounds in our nation. They tear at our social fabric and they constitute each one of them immense human suffering which must be addressed. Yet in our overly politicized culture, we have permitted the core unity of human compassion to become fragmented so often into separate partisan categories. And even worse, we have allowed our own sense of the moral imperatives which flow from true Christian compassion to be distorted by a partisan lens. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we must understand that this spectrum of human suffering in our nation calls upon us all and calls upon us to act jointly and consistently. Such suffering must not be the basis for social division or political identity, but rather first and foremost a demand for Christ-like action. The plaintive call of Black Lives Matter and the populist impulse reflected in the support for Donald Trump are both signs of woundedness in our nation. The victims of globalization include both the undocumented and the displaced blue collar workers of the Midwest. The central challenge is whether we can meet our woundedness with care and action which are not filtered through party or ideology. Only if a truly comprehensive sense of compassion takes hold and is rebuilt up in our nation in a profound way will we be, be able to meet that challenge of woundedness that surrounds us all. A third virtue that is essential to a Catholic political imagination for our nation in the present day is the call to integrity. One of the greatest temptations of the Christian moral life in general, I believe, 
is to want to invite Jesus into the great majority of our moral and spiritual lives, but to exclude him from certain compartments of our lives that we have come to feel quite peaceful with, even though we recognize at some deep level that these compartments are strikingly con contrary to the gospel. I fear that for far too many of us, our political lives are one of those compartments where we exclude the life of the gospel and replace it with anger, divisiveness, scorn, and animosity. We prefer to rage against political enemies, to embrace the striking hypocrisy which characterizes our political leadership in excusing today the very same behaviors by political allies that we condemned yesterday when committed by political opponents. There is a tremendous visceral reward to engaging in such par fierce partisan political battle and in the excitement and stimulation it brings. But there is also a tremendous cultural and political cost for our nation. And there is a wider corrosion to our individual soul and spirit that such fierce partisan animosities produce. It is for both these reasons that the Catholic political imagination for our day must include a recommitment to integrity, to inviting God and the gospel even to this, into this very resistant compartment of our moral lives. A fourth political virtue for our day is that of enduring hope. Movingly quoting from Martin Luther King, the Holy Father in his speech to Congress reminded the people of the United States that we have always been a nation of dreams, quote, dreams which lead to action, to participation, to commitment. On so many levels, our current political crisis is a result not of dreaming too grandly, but of failing to dream, of losing hope. We have become so um, overcome with divisions that confront us that the native optimism of our nation has been swallowed by a coarsening pessimism, rooted in the conviction that a better future could come for our nation only if some Americans lose out, are excluded, forgotten, or denied. The danger in our current political climate is that the people of the United States will come to accept the current political division, nihilism, hypocrisy, and anger in our culture as normal. In 1983, Daniel Moynihan wrote an article in, entitled Defining Deviancy Down, in which he cited the seminal argu argument by Emil Durkheim, that when a society accepts a specific destructive pattern of behavior over time, even when that pattern has historically been condemned by society, that pattern will become the new behavioral norm. In our current political life, we are in the process of defining deviancy down, and we have been doing so for the past two decades. A Catholic political imagination which truly embraces hope will not accept the mo movement to define deviancy down. It will refuse to accept a new normal that is deeply destructive. Catholic social teaching inherently dreams dreams and is compelled to make these dreams a reality. In a historical moment when paralysis seems to grip our political life, there is no more important contribution that the Catholic community can make to the U.S. than an unrelenting commitment to rejuvenate our cultural and political life precisely in the face of the enormous obstacles that stand in the way of such renewal. Finally and most importantly, a Catholic political imagination for the current moment of American life must include the virtue of dialogue and encounter. In his speech to Congress, Pope Francis pointed to the words of Thomas Merton. Merton had said, quote, free by nature and by the image of God. Nevertheless, the prisoner of my own violence and selfishness, an image of the world into which I was born. It was Merton's, Merton's graced spiritual journey to escape that prison by bringing a sacred sense of dialogue and encounter, which ultimately was the only instrument that can change the world in which we live. 
We live in a political culture which is, in which substantive dialogue across ideological and partisan divides is dying. And we live in an ecclesial culture in this country in which those most committed to the work of transforming our nation through the realization of Catholic social teaching are also deeply factionalized, torn in two by the fissure which separates the life and dignity imperatives that flow from the gospel. A Catholic political virtue ethic for this moment in our nation's history must recognize the need for dialogue, encounter, and unity is more important than any single policy issue that we face today. Because such a stance of encounter and dialogue is itself the foundation and prerequisite for any genuine pursuit of the common good. It is for this reason that we must undertake with renewed conviction our vocation as genuine peacemakers within our nation and within our church in the full recognition that the passionate substantive commitments which divide us authentically, they flow from a dedication to making the gospel truly present in the world on both sides. In Gaudete et Exultate, Pope Francis acknowledges that genuine peacemaking is enormously difficult, quote. It is hard work. It calls for great openness of mind and heart. Since it is not about creating a consensus on paper or a transient peace for a contented minority, nor can it attempt to ignore or disregard conflict. Instead, it must face conflict head on, resolve it and make it a link in the chain of a new process. We need to be artisans of peace, for building peace is a craft that demands serenity, creativity, sensitivity, and skill. The central mission of the church in the political order today is to evangelize the culture of politics through the witness of believers. At the present moment, <clears throat> this task is not primarily a didactic one. It is most profoundly an affective mission designed to foster within the church a truly Catholic political imagination that addresses directly the most corrosive elements of our political crisis. The Catholic political must embrace the virtues of solidarity, compassion, integrity, hope, and peace building. Each of these dispositions of heart and soul relies primarily not on political argument and analysis, but upon a fundamental virtue of the human spirit. Each is by its nature a bridge building first force in the divided political culture which we must evangelize because solidarity, compassion, integrity, hope, and encounter simply cannot be broken down into one party or the other. The primary method of the church's evangelization of our political culture in the current moment must proceed not from norms or principles, but from just such dispositions of the soul. In short, the Catholic leadership in the United States must seek to foster a political virtue ethic for our time to guide both Catholics and our nation as a whole in their roles as citizens and believers. In the Evangelii Nunciandi, the encyclical of Pope Paul VI, he described the action of Christian witness in the world Quote, above all, the gospel must be proclaimed by witnesses. Take a Christian or a handful of Christians who in the midst of their own community show their capacity for understanding and acceptance, their sharing of life and destiny with other people, their solidarity with the efforts to all for whatever is noble and good. Let us suppose in addition that these witnesses radiate in an altogether simple and unaffected way their faith in values that go beyond the current values and their hope in something that is not seen and that no one would dare to imagine. The church in the United States needs just such witnesses in the political order at this moment in our history. We need witnesses who radiate the solidarity which binds nations together rather than tears them apart. We need witnesses who display the comprehensive sense of compassion that the Lord himself both preached and practiced. 
We need witnesses who profoundly treasure God's gift of human life at every moment when it is under attack. We need witnesses who have incorporated authentic Christian integrity lives and actions. And ultimately, we need witnesses who will dream the dreams, capable of dispelling the pessimism and resignation that suffuse our pol current political culture in the false belief that nothing can be changed. Thank you very much.